So welcome to today's webinar. My name is Hidehito Horinoshi from National Cancer Center Hospital, Tokyo, Japan. And I am be I will be moderating this webinar. And uh, thank you for the ASCC and the JLCS. This is a uh, this is a memorial first time joint webinar supported by both uh, important organization. So let's begin by uh, running through the housekeeping notes. So you will be able to find uh, you will be able to find a video recording of the webinar on the website within the next week. Your camera and the microphone will remain off for the, this webinar. Please enter the uh, any question to you have the Q&A discussion into the Q&A section at the bottom of the webinar. You may use the chat function for the other discussions, but mainly you, you I would like to request you to use a Q&A. And we will not be using the raise the hand function for questions. We plan to have a, pan, uh, a keynote lecture and a panel discussion. Uh, and please enter your questions into the Q&A section at the, any point of during the talks. So I will hand over to the Professor Mitsumi as a keynote moderators. Thank you, Professor Mitsumi. Thank you very much, Dr. Horinouchi, for my introduction. Uh, my name is Tetsuya Mitsutomi from Kinda University, Osaka, Japan. And uh, today I'm, I'm a very um, excited to have the Dr. Andy Kueta Ferp from Spain as a keynote speaker. As you may know, Dr. Andy Kueta Ferp is the uh, head of the Thoracic Oncology Unit at Valdebron Institute of Oncology, uh, Valdebron University, Barcelona. She's a, a lead author of the Impower Zero and the recently published, and which will be the main topic of the today's lecture, I, I assume. And also, you may remember she's a, a lead author of the famous Natch trial, which compared the preoperative chemo uh, with the postoperative chemo. And also, uh, she was the uh, co conference chair of the uh, WCLC 2019 in Barcelona before the COVID 19 era. And also, uh, she's a former board of director of the ISLC. And uh, Dr. Perb, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We are very look forward to your lecture. So please start. Thank you, Dr. Mitsudomi. Uh, it's a real honor for me to be here today. And I would like to thank ISLC and the Japan Lung Cancer Society. It's a real honor for me to participate in this session. So I'm going to discuss emerging perioperative treatment using immune checkpoint inhibitors in patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer. You can see here my disclosures. So now we have three studies uh, randomized that are positive using immunotherapy in patients with early stage disease. I'm going to review the two trials using adjuvant immunotherapy, the Empower 010 and also the Keynote 091, and also the randomized trial analyzing chemo plus immunotherapy in the new adjuvant setting, the Checkmate 816. First, the Empower 010. In this trial, 1,280 patients with completely resected stage 1b with tumor size of at least 4 centimeters, 2 and 3a, uh, receive at least one, but not more than four cycles of cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And then 1,005 patients who are still met eligibility criteria were randomized to receive one year of atacilucimab versus best supportive care. The stratification factors included gender, stage, histology, and PDL1 status. And the primary endpoints were the investigator assessed, disease free survival tested hierarchically. First, in patients with stage 2 and 3A and PDL1 positive tumors, if positive in all randomized stage 2 and 3A population, and if positive in patients with stage 1B, 2 and 3A. A key secondary endpoint was the disease free survival in PDL1 50% or higher, a stage 2 and 3A population. When we analyzed the patient characteristics of the patients randomized, the median age was 62. There are 65% of the patients male, 35% of the patients with squamous cell carcinoma, and 40% of the patients with pathological stage 3A disease. PDL1 status was negative in 40% of the patients. When we analyzed the adverse events 
associated with adjuvant at Lizumab, we have seen that there was a 0.8% grade five treatment related adverse events. And in 18% of the patients, Atislizumab was uh, stopped due to uh, adverse events uh, associated with Atislizumab. In this slide, you can see the disease free survival analyzed in the three study populations. For those patients with stage 2 and 3A and PDL1 positive tumors, atezolizumab was associated with longer disease free survival when compared to the control arm with a hazard ratio of 0.66. At three years, there were 60% of the patients disease free in the atezolizumab arm, 48% in the control arm. In all randomized stage two and three population, atezolizumab was associated with longer disease free survival when compared to control with a hazard ratio of 0.79. At uh, three years, uh, there were 56% of the patients disease free in the atezolizumab arm, 49% uh, in the control arm. When we include uh, the patients with stage one B, two and three A, the, uh, the hazard ratio was 0.81. At this analysis, the statistical significance boundary was not closed and the follow-up is ongoing. When we analyze the key uh, subgroup analysis for disease survival in the Empower 010, we can see that the hazard ratio is similar in those patients with squamous cell carcinoma and non squamous cell carcinoma. For those patients with pathological stage 2A, the hazard ratio is 0.68. For those patients with pathological stage 2B, hazard ratio 0.88. For those patients with pathological stage 3A, the hazard ratio is 0.81. When we analyze all patients with stage two and three A, we mention and PDL1 positive tumors, the hazard ratio is 0.66. For those patients with PDL1 negative tumors, the hazard ratio is 0.97. And for those patients with PDL1 50% or higher, the hazard ratio is 0.43. During the ELCC meeting, we presented the patterns of disease relapse for those patients with stage 2 and 3A and PDL1 50% or higher. 44% of the patients in the control arm progress, 22% in the atezolizumab arm. The percentage of patients with local regional uh, only progression was similar between the two treatment arms, around uh, 15%. Distant only metastasis was seen in 18% of the patients in the control arm, 5% of the patients in the atezolizumab arm. And CNS progression only was seen in 6% of the patients in the control arm, 1% in the atezo arm. The oral survival information was immature uh, for those patients with the stage 2 and 3A and PDL1 positive tumors was a trend in favor of atezolizumab. However, again, this oral survival information is not mature. And our, our conclusion was that IMPOWER 010 showed a disease free survival benefit with atezolizumab versus best supportive care after adjuvant chemotherapy in patients with resected stage two and three A with pronounced benefit in the subgroup of patients with PDL1 positive tumors and the greatest magnitude of benefit for those patients with PDL1 50% or higher. The Keynote 091 trial was presented by Dr. Pazares during the ESMO virtual plenary in March 2022. In this trial, eligibility criteria was similar. Patients with pathological stage 1B with tumor size of at least four centimeters two or three A, according to the 70 nm classification. PDL1 testing was performed centrally, and uh, then the patients uh, eligible for randomization were those patients without evidence of disease. Adjuvant chemotherapy should be considered for patients with pathological stage 1B, and strongly recommended for a stage two and three A disease. And patients were randomized to receive pembrolizumab for one year or placebo. 
This is a placebo control trial. A stratification factors included disease stage, PDL1, receipt of adjuvant chemotherapy, yes or no, and geographic region. And the trial has two primary endpoints the disease free survival in the overall population and the disease free survival in PDL1, 50% or higher population. Patient characteristics, uh, similar of what we have seen in Empower. The median age was 65. There are 62% uh, 60, uh, of the patients with non ischemic histology. There are 30% uh, of the patients with pathological stage 3A disease. In this trial, 14% of the patients were previously not been treated with adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. And PDL1 negative tumors that were observed in 39% of the patients, and PDL1 50% or higher in 30% of the patients. Adverse events associated with adjuvant pembrolizumab were similar of what we uh, have observed with uh, atezolizumab. There are 0.7% uh, uh, of the patients that uh, pembrolizumab was associated to death. And uh, uh, in this uh, study, there are 19% of the patients with uh, pembrolizumab treatment discontinuation due to adverse events. These are the two uh, primary endpoints. In the overall population, disease survival was longer with pembrolizumab when compared to placebo with a hazard ratio of 0.76, the uh, median uh, uh, disease survival was 53 months in the pembrolizumab arm, 42 months in the placebo control arm. In the population of PDL1 50% or higher, there is no difference in disease survival between the two treatment arms. The median disease survival was not reached in any of the two arms, and the hazard ratio was 0.82. Subgroup analysis for disease free survival in this trial show us that for pathological stage 1b, the hazard ratio was 0.76. For those patients with pathological stage 2, the hazard ratio 0.7. For those patients with pathological stage 3a, the hazard ratio was 0.92. The uh, hazard ratio in non schemos was 0.67. 1.04 for schemus, and uh, for those patients with, sorry, without adjuvant chemotherapy, the hazard ratio was 0 0.25, 0 0.73 for those patients receiving prior adjuvant chemotherapy. Overall survival was not mature in the study. The hazard ratio is 0 0.87. And the authors concluded during the presentation that data suggests pembrolizumab has the potential to be a new adjuvant treatment option for patients with a stage 1b with a tumor size of at, uh, at least 4 centimeters, 2 or 3a, according to the 70 and classification, following complete resection and adjuvant chemotherapy when recommended, regardless of PDL1 expression. Here in, in this slide, you can see the disease free survival in two studies, including all patient population, stage 1b, 2, and 3a. In Keynote, the hazard ratio is 0 0.76. In Empower, is 0 0.81, including also patients with pathological stage 1b disease. And here, the disease free survival in PDL1, 50% or higher. As we mentioned in the Keynote, uh, there is the analysis of patients with pathological 1B2 and 3A, and uh, we mentioned the hazard ratio is not statistically significant. In the Empower, we have the information of PDL1 high in pathological stage 2 and 3A disease, and in this case, the hazard ratio is 0 0.43. As you know, there are ongoing adjuvant immunotherapy trials uh, 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 pending of the results. The AMBIL trial analyzing adjuvant nivolumab, BR31 analyzing adjuvant durvalumab, Alchemist trial comparing chemotherapy versus chemotherapy for cycles followed by pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy plus pembrolizumab for four cycles followed by pembrolizumab. And then I would like to mention a study from the Spanish lung cancer group in the adjuvant setting comparing four cycles of uh, chemotherapy versus four cycles of chemotherapy in combination with immunotherapy 
followed by immunotherapy. The third study is the Checkmate 816 in the neoadjuvant setting. In here, uh, patients are included, uh, eligibility criteria included, resectable a stage 1b with tumor size of at least 4 centimeters to N3a according to the seventh edition, but these are patients with clinical stage, not with pathological stage. Patients 358 were randomized to receive three cycles of chemotherapy followed by surgery or three cycles of chemotherapy plus nivolumab followed by surgery. The stratification factors included the stage, PDL1 and gender, and the primary endpoints were pathological complete response and event-free survival. 179 patients received chemo plus nivo, 179 chemotherapy alone. The median age was 65 years, 70% uh, of the patients were male, and we have 63% of the patients included with a stage 3A disease. PDL1 negative tumor was observed in 40% of the patients and PDL1 50% or higher in 23% of the patients. Overall, in the NIVO plus chemo arm, 83% of the patients had definitive surgery. In the chemo alone arm, 75% had definitive surgery after the neoadjuvant strategy. And when the authors analyzed the adverse events in the uh, in, at surgery, there were no differences between chemotherapy and chemotherapy plus uh, immunotherapy. We knew that a major, uh, pathological complete response was higher for those patients receiving chemo plus immunotherapy, 24% versus 2.2% in the chemotherapy alone arm. And when we analyze the pathological complete response for those patients treated with NIVO plus chemotherapy, the percentage is similar in patients with stage 1b or 2 versus 3 in a schemus versus non schemus histology. According to the PDL1 expression, the pathological complete response with chemo plus nivolumab was 16% for those patients with PDL1 negative tumors. It was 44% for those patients with PDL1 50% or higher. We mentioned the surgical outcomes. Overall, the percentage of lobectomies uh, seemed slightly higher for those patients receiving chemo plus NIVO, and the opposite, the percentage of pneumonectomies uh, slightly higher for those patients receiving chemotherapy alone. In the recent publication and in the presentation in ACR, we have the data of event-free survival. Event-free survival was longer with chemo plus nivolumab when compared to chemotherapy with a hazard ratio of 0.63. Median event-free survival was 32 months for those patients treated with chemo plus nivo, 21 months for those patients treated with chemotherapy alone. When we analyze patients subgroups, the benefit of chemo plus immuno in those patients with PDL1 negative tumors was 0.85 for those patients in PDL1 positive. It was 0.41 in those patients with PDL1 50% or higher, 0.24. In the trial, those patients with pathological complete response had better uh, survival outcomes. And also, it was an interim analysis of overall survival, again, not yet mature. The median overall survival was not reached in any of the two treatment arms. The two-year survival was 83% of the patients in the chemo plus NIVO arm, 71% in the chemotherapy alone arm. And the conclusion is that the Checkmate 816 is the first phase three study with a new adjuvant immunotherapy-based combination for resectable non-small cell lung cancer to show improved event-free survival and pathological complete response, along with promising overall survival results. And these results support new adjuvant NIVO in combination with chemotherapy as a new standard of care for patients with resectable non-small cell lung cancer. I would like to discuss the clinical trial endpoints. In the adjuvant trials, is disease-free survival, the definition is the same. However, there are some differences. 
in Empower 010, as we mentioned, is an open label trial. And the, uh, the primary endpoint, investigator says this is free survival, was tested hierarchically. First, in a stage two and three population and PDL1 positive tumors, if positive in all randomized stage two and three population, and if positive in a stage one B2 and three A. In the keynote 091, the is a placebo controlled trial, and there are two primary endpoints. This is pre survival in the overall population, including patients with pathological stage 1B with tumor size greater than four centimeters, and this is pre survival in PDL1 PDL 50% or higher population. In Checkmate 816, pathological complete response is one of the endpoints. The definition no residual viable tumor cells in the primary tumor and lymph nodes. And in this case, the pathological complete response was assessed by a pathology central review and also event-free survival. And again, in the checkmate, event-free survival was uh, determined according to the blinded, blinded independent central review. We have discussed in the last years the role of major pathological uh, response. The definition is less than 10% of viable tumor uh, tissue in the uh, surgical specimens. Some studies, the termination of major pathological response is challenging. I would like to recommend the paper from the ISLC published in JCO with a multidisciplinary recommendations for pathological assessment for lung cancer resection specimens after neoadjuvant strategies. And we have a number of randomized trials ongoing with neoadjuvant strategies and it's true that uh, the major pathological response is not uh, one of the primary endpoints of these trials. Time power 0, uh, 30 is uh, analyzing chemo plus atezolizumab in the preoperative setting versus chemotherapy. The primary endpoint is event free survival. The keynote 671 is analyzing chemo versus chemo plus pembrolizumab with the primary endpoints of event free survival and overall survival. The Asian trial comparing chemo plus uh, placebo or chemo plus durvalumab in the new adjuvant setting with uh, primary endpoints of pathological complete response and event free survival, and also the Checkmate 77T analyzing chemo plus nivolumab. And again, the primary endpoint event free survival. Dr. Mitsudomi mentioned during the kind introduction the NACH trial. And I, the, the, the reason to include here the NICE trial is that probably we are discussing different patient population when we compare the adjuvant trials with the new adjuvant trials. The NICE trial published more than 10 years ago compared uh, in patients with early stage with the clinical staging surgery upfront versus surgery followed by adjuvant chemotherapy or new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. In this trial, patients with uh, stage uh, 1B2 and T3 and 1 were included, again, the clinical stage, but we have seen at surgery that for those patients randomized to surgery up front, there were 20% of the patients with pathological end to disease that we were not able to diagnose in the clinical staging pre-surgery. Probably this has changed in the last 10 years, but the reality is that we detect a number of pathological end to disease at surgery not previously detected with clinical staging. So when we mentioned that in the new adjuvant strategies, 10, 15% of the patients uh, uh, do not undergo surgery, probably they are not exactly the same patient population. In these trials, as we have seen in the Checkmate 816, there are 30% of the patients with the stage 3A included. And in the adjuvant immunotherapy trials, all patients have had surgery per definition. So the randomization is after surgery. All patients have uh, completely resected tumors. And probably we include those patients <coughs> with pathological end to disease not identified pre surgery. Compliance, we have seen in uh, the NACH trial that the chemotherapy compliance was uh, higher in the preoperative setting when compared to adjuvant setting when the patients were randomized upfront with the clinical staging 
in the neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy arm, 97% of the patients receive preoperative chemotherapy. In the adjuvant setting, only 66% of the patients, and the main reason was a slow recovery from surgery. And then we have some information about immunotherapy compliance in the three trials. In the IMPOWER uh, 010, <coughs> we, have, we know that 1,269 patients receive adjuvant chemotherapy. And finally, 1,005 patients were randomized to receive immunotherapy or control. In the Kino 091, 1,955 patients were registered. And finally, 1,177 patients were randomized. And in the Checkmate 816, 773 patients were enrolled. And finally, 179 uh, were allocated to neoadjuvant chemo plus nivolumab, 179 to neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But from these patients, 97% of them received the systemic therapy. We have some discussions about what we should do in patients with a stage 1B disease with immunotherapy. In the Empower 010, there are 13% of the patients with pathological uh, stage 1B. And according to the hierarchically designed uh, the analysis, including all patient population, the hazard ratio, as we mentioned, is 0.81. The statistical significance boundary, when we include all the patients for disease survival was not closed, and the uh, follow-up is ongoing. In the Keynote 091 trial, there are 14% of the patients with pathological stage 1B. And here, the hazard ratio for those patients with pathological stage 1B is 0.76, for patients with pathological stage 2, 0.70, and for patients with a stage 3A, 0.92. In Empower, in the Checkmate 816, we have the results together, a stage 1B and 2, and a stage 3A disease. And for those patients with stage 1B and 2 together, the hazard ratio for event-free survival is 0.87. For patients with stage 3A is 0.54. The other discussion point is PDL1 as a predictive marker in early stage. In the Empower 010, uh, clearly the results show that for those patients with PDL1 high, 50% uh, uh, or higher, and a stage 2 and 3A, the hazard ratio is 0 .40, uh, 53, 43. Sorry. In the PULSE 091 trial, there is no relationship between the benefit and the PDL1 staining. And perhaps for those patients in Checkmate 816, we also see some kind of relation of better pathological complete response or better hazard ratio in event-free survival favoring chemo plus immuno for those patients PDL1 high. And when we analyze testing, probably testing now is a standard of care, but it's true that perhaps it's more easy to perform testing in those resected specimens when compared to those patients uh, with only a, a sample at diagnosis. An important point of information probably is the circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and this has been analyzed in the Empower 010. There was analysis of circulating tumor DNA samples just before starting chemotherapy. And in general, what we have seen is that the presence of circulating tumor DNA is prognosis. However, the patients with circulating tumor DNA positive and also negative benefited from adjuvant atislizum. There is a mermaid uh, trial ongoing analyzing the potential contribution of the circulating tumor DNA and the minimal residual disease uh, determination. And in Checkmate 816, we know that for those patients with circulating tumor DNA clearance in the, uh, the pathological complete response with chemo plus nivo was 46% with chemotherapy was 
And I would like to mention uh, this uh, proposal. This is an important uh, paper by Dr. Mitsudomi recently published. And perhaps circulating tumor DNA may well have a role in the patients in the clinical practice. And it's true that, for example, those patients with circulating tumor DNA positive a diagnosis may well be in the future candidates for new adjuvant strategies and perhaps to decide the treatment according to the presence or not of the circulating tumor DNA. So this is exciting times in early stage disease. Immunotherapy uh, will change uh, the standard of care, but we have a number of unanswered questions. We don't know if neoadjuvant is better than adjuvant uh, immunotherapy, but probably, as I mentioned, these are two different uh, patient populations. We need to understand more the role of PDL1 as biomarker. Uh, one important question in the adjuvant setting is uh, better to give adjuvant chemotherapy followed by immunotherapy or the combination up front of adjuvant chemotherapy plus immunotherapy. And also for those patients receiving new adjuvant strategies, we need to define the adequate adjuvant therapy after new adjuvant chemo plus immunotherapy and resection. And uh, these are my final thoughts. Immunotherapy is, will be a standard of care for early stage non-small cell lung cancer. In my opinion, EGFR and alt white type. As I mentioned, adjuvant and new adjuvant strategies probably will, uh, be, uh, will be different in different patient population. Uh, it's important to have more markers uh, beyond PDL1. Probably the circulating tumor DNA technology may help to individualize therapy, and we need to focus on long term survivor needs. And thank you again. It's a real honor for me to participate in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. So really a comprehensive lecture about the perioperative therapy. So, so far we have the seven questions. So we are running out of time, but I'd like to go to the QA session. So the first two questions from Dr. Wehara, Dr. Sakara is very similar. So the Dr. Wehart's question is in patients with PDL1 more than 50%, what factors can explain the different outcomes between the PEMBRO and uh, the Zoho study? And the second question is why didn't the keynote 091 trial show statistically significant results in the PDL1 high expression? Did not show, right? Yeah. So yeah, this may be very difficult, but most of the people uh, feels like that. So do you have any thoughts about uh, why the uh, yeah. keynote 091 so such results? Difficult question. As you know, we don't know the answer. <laughs> it was unexpected. I think the results, uh, the different results with PDL in patients with PDL1 high uh, were in some way unexpected. It's true that in IMPOWER uh, 010, we have the results in patients with pathological stage 2 and 3. Keynote include also patients with pathological stage 1B. Uh, as you know, one uh, study is a placebo control. The, the, the other one is open label. Uh, the, uh, in one study, adjuvant chemotherapy was mandatory, so probably the, there are differences in the, in the design. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, the answer okay. for this important question. <laughs> okay, so let's move to the next one. Next one is uh, um, from Dr. Suda. I think the recurrence patterns between Atezo and the placebo um, seem interesting. Is there any other data? in IO adjuvant or neo adjuvant studies regarding recurrence patterns, so including the uh, CNS METs or the local recurrence versus distant METs. So I, I think it's also a very interesting question. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I'm not aware uh, of other uh, data similar of uh, what we have presented. It's true that when in the empower, we, com we compared the pattern of relapse in the whole population, including patients with PDL1 1% or higher. There were no major differences in the pattern of relapse. And we have seen this difference in these patients with PDL1 50% or higher. Mm -hmm. But yes, I'm not aware of on any, any other experience uh, similar of that. Okay, and the next two questions are also very similar. So the Dr. Beshu's question is, uh, 
Uh, do you think to pray operative or possible treatment will be the mainstream in so which of the preoperative or postoperative treatment will be the mainstream in actual practice in the future? So the next question is, uh, uh, it looks that preoperative immunotherapy is better, has a better outcome compared to the postoperative. So they, he compared the 816 versus uh, 91 or 010. So do you know, but uh, you mentioned that the population may be a bit different, but uh, do you know, do you think, which do you think is the mainstream of the future perioperative therapy? Yes, it's true that we will have other uh, randomized trial in the near future, uh, uh, that we will have the results. But I think at least in my opinion, no, for those patients, probably a stage one and two, we will, uh, I think, recommend surgery and then adjuvant uh, chemo plus immunotherapy if needed. And I think for those patients with a stage three disease, now we are doing multidisciplinary treatment before surgery. So probably these are the patients that we will treat with chemo plus immunotherapy and then uh, surgery. But yeah, uh, something that probably will have more information uh, in the near uh, months. So Dr. Hornich, we have a four more questions, but can I extend a bit more for the QA? Dr. Horinochi. Sure. Yeah, up to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so the next one is, uh, Regarding the reimbursement re issue of the new adjuvant atezolizumab, what is your opinion about the PDL1 requirement? Difference is there any difference between the FDA and the EMA? It's a very difficult to answer. Right? Yeah, so as far as I know, atezolizumab has been approved by FDA, no, uh, for those patients with stage two and three and PDL1 positive. Uh, Tumors, uh, and we are uh, 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 still waiting for the for the approval by EMA. It's true that there are uh, some uh, countries in Europe, such as uh, Switzerland, that they have now the approval for patients with PDL1 50% or higher. I think for those patients with PDL1 1 to 49%, probably there are a number of patients who also benefit from immunotherapy. I think this is a, a, a you know from one to 49% is to to a lot of different pdl ones probably it's not the same a pdl one of 40 percent or one percent no so yeah we don't know for sure what would be the final decision by ima but i would be comfortable to use immunotherapy in patients with pdl one uh, one percent or higher for the impact zero one zero can we use a, uh two to c3 antibody instead of the sp263 no, any... we have, no, we have the results with oh, SP263. Okay, and we have three more, but uh, it looks like it's very long. So the, for the time sake, could you answer by the typing? Yeah, to the, those questions. Uh, and yeah. uh, uh, it's a pity, but uh, I have to close uh, this QA session and I'd like to hand over the uh, chair's role to Dr. Horinoch. Uh, again, thank you very much, Dr. Perry. It's a very nice lecture. Uh, no, no, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, and see you soon. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Ferret. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a pity, but uh, I I would like to go into the Japanese session, and I will change the language to the Japanese, uh, uh, solely for the international audiences, yeah, because this is a JLCS and ISSC joint webinar. The half of the portion will be there in Japanese. ということで、日本語にあの切り替えてリラックスして、あのまたスタートしていこうと思います。いくつかのあのご質問はまたこの後の Q&A、えー、とパネルディスカッションでもチェックできるかなと思います。で、えっ、ー、とこの後私の方から少しハウスキーピングのスライドをえっ、ー、と共有いたします。まず、えっと、あの今日の,あのパネルの先生方も、三つ富先生は今、えっと、チェアをしていただきました。で、私と、あとはがんセンター中病院の病理診断科の矢田部先生と、あと、静岸の、えっと、ケンモン先生、そしてあの近代に移動されまして、プロフェッサーになられた、えっと、津谷先生でございます。で、えっと、今日はですね、あの先生方にお話しいただくので、一応あの、えっと、学会のルールでディスクロージャーのスライドをささっと、えー、表示させて。いただきまして、で早速スライドシェアを止めましてセッションに入りたいというふうに思います
、今日ですね、えーとまあ、大体あの想定の通り時間が押しておりますので、えー、あのいくつか準備いたしました、えー、Q&A の中からあの、えー、とピックアップして、いくつかピックアップして、あと、あのー、また先ほどいただいたご質問の中からあの答えきれてないもので、ここで取り上げるのが妥当そうなものがありましたら、そちらもというふうに思っております。でえー、とちょっとあの英語のセッションのところでもカバーされておりましたけれどもあの、えー、とおさらいの意味も含めて、えー、一つ一つやっていこうかと思います。まず、えー、と1点目にやっぱりあの、えー、と英語のセッションの Q&A の中にもあ,のありましたけれども、えー、とチャットでも、えー、とシェアいたしますが皆様に。よいしょ1つ目が、えー、と手術今これからあなた私たち日本でも手術器の治療、あの IO を使って行うことになりますけれども、PDL1 の陽性患者の中でも PDL1 の高発言に限定するとか、あるいは限定しないとかって、まあ、本当に対照的な試験の結果が出てまいりましたので、その辺について、えー、と皆様、どう思われますかってところをお聞きしたいと思います。で今日はあのパネリストでご参加いただいております、えー、と先生方にあの聞いていこうかと思いますけれども、じゃあまず、えー、とそうですね、ケンモ先生、いかがでしょうか、この点。はい、ありがとうございます。あの、静岡感染ターの検物です。えっ、ー、と、まあ、アテゾリズマブが先に承認をされることを想定した答えとすると、現時点でやはり、えっ、ー、と、陽性、特に強陽性の方で、まあ、治療効果が高そうだというデータがあるので、まあ、現時点では少し強弱があると思いますが、陽性の方では一つの標準治療になっていくんだと思っています。ただ、さっきの091が出てきてですね、どう解釈するか非常に難しいところでありますが、インディケーションが変わってきた場合には、もしかしたら PDR の発言によって使う薬剤を変えるということになるんじゃないかなと思っています。で少なくともサブグループの結果、そして解釈ができない以上は、まずは現状では試験の結果ベースで薬剤を選択せざるを得ないので、まあ、PDR が少なくとも後発言の場合は現時点ではあってで、えー、と1から49はもうどちらも使ってもいいでしょうし、1% 未満のところはペンブローということになるんではないかなと、個人的には思っておりますありがとうございます。内科の目線からということ次はあの津田先生、外科の先生の目線からいかがですか。はい、ありがとうございます。えっとまあ、先にインパワーゼロ一ゼロの結果からすると、まあ五十パーセント以上はまず使いたいと思うと思うんですけれども、まあ一から四十九の結果がまあ微妙なので、そこはまあディスカッションになると思うんですが、あのまあ一つはやっぱり今までなかった薬剤がこう使えるようになる可能性があるということで、まあ患者さんにとってはこう選択肢が増えるということ。があると思いますであとはこう、まあ、50% 以上が結構いい結果だったのでそのまあ1から49でもそのまあ 1% に近い患者さんと 50% に近い 45% ぐらいだとやっぱりこう我々が持つ期待感も多分多少違うので、まあ、その1から49でもその数字によって少し判断変わるのかなと思います。あとはいいずれれにしてもまあ使えるととうことであればそのまあ、術後なのでその N2 の状態とかですねやっぱその再発リスクによって、まあ、その使いたいとかあのちょっと回避したいとかそういう、まあ、ことは、まあ、あの患者さんごとによって判断されるのかなと思います。はい、ありがとうございます。外科の先生らしい目線でございます。あの今日、今日あの矢田部先生もご参加いただいてるんですけど、あのまあ確かにクローンが抗体のクローンが違うとはいえ、ここまでなんか臨床の結果で大きななんかあの 50% 以上のところで雰囲気が違ったっていうのは何か矢田部先生的にありますか。いや特にあのえっ、ー、とそういう意味ではあのディシジョンがですね、多分政権によるものなのか、いやそれが果たしてその。今日本ではそのセルブロック例えばその EU、EBUS の FNA で取られたものはおそらくこの試験の中に入ってないんですよねだけど実際は EBUS、FNA でかなりこう診断されてると思うんですよそうするとそういう検体を使って果たしてできるものなのかっていうのはちょっとあの要するにその検査がの、えー、と材料として適切なのかどうかっていうのは少しであのディスカッションしなくちゃいけないのかなっていうふうに思います。ありがとうございます。まさにあのあれですね。次のあのせしなんかポイントともちょっと絡んできますので、あ、三木先生忘れてました。何かこの点について、五十パーセント以上にすべきとかなんか。ええ、やっぱりその一パーセント以上ポジティブですけど、そのポジティブは五十パーセント以上が引っ張ってるのは、あのいつも四期のあのキーノート四十ゼロ四二試験見となんか似てる感じがするんですけど、なので。やっぱりあの、下に先生が言ったように、そのベネフィットがあるかどうかの要素にやっぱりそれも入ると思うんですよね
、まあ、リスクとベネフィット、だからやっぱり PDL1 は、まあ、1から以上ならみんなこう等しく同じトーンで進めるんではなくて、やはり PDL1 の,あのパーセンテージが高い人は、多少リスクがあっても進めるけど。弱い人はちょっとやめとこうかとか、患者さんの希望もより強く説得するとか、まあ、そういうことはあるのかなというふうに思いました。で、あの黄色の91はちょっとわけ,わけわからないというか、チャンスあるんでそういうことが起こるかなという気もします。まあ、思考停止ですね、そこは。はい、ありがとうございました。では、えー、と次の、あのー、あれですね、テーマに移ろうと思います。で次はですね、あのーあれですね、やっぱり、えっと、816試験も含めて出てきましたので、まあ、例えば術後であれば手術の検体でっていうふうなことになると思うんですけれども例えば術前も考慮に入れるってことになってくると今まではまあ純粋にも4期だけで行ってたようなバイオマー検索に関してどのポイントで行うのが妥当なのかとかあるいはどこまで逆にできるのかって、まあ、矢田部先生もこの点どのさっきあの,のコメントにもつながるものですのでお聞きしたいんですけどまずはあのまた先ほどと同じ順番であのケモ先生とかにご施設の例えば今どのぐらいまでやってますよとかって状況とかあるいはなんかあのご意見も含めていただければと思いますケモ先生いかがですかあ、えー、と当院の状況を言いますとまずは PD あの術前にバイオマガ検査がうちは全くしてないので、えー、と術後もえー、とトライアルがない限りは EGFR、PDL1 を測っていない、かなりコンサーバーな多分施設になっているんだと思います。でまあ、ただ、とはいえです、ね、今後、まあえーと、EGFR の TKI、そして PDL1、そうは PD えー、と ICI がです、ね、術後で使えて、場合によっては実前で使えるようになる場合には、多分施設のスタンスを変えないといけないと思っていますが、ここでも八戸先生に言っていただいたように、その組織が十分でない検体でやるよりも、手術してしっかり取れた検体でやった方が、多分より正確な。えー、とバイオマーカー検査ができると思うので、まあ、そういう意味でも個人的にはやっぱり、えー、とプライマリーサージェリーでフォローバイケモセラピーの方がバイオマーカー、えー、とを評価する上でも非常にまあリーズナブルな治療戦略かなとは思ってますありがとうございますあのコンサーバー質感ということでしょうねでサニー先生いかがですか<笑>あ,ありがとうございます、まあ、今はまだ承認されてない状況だと、必ずしもその実前検体で測らないと思うんですが、まあ、今後、ただそのネオアジュバントで IO も使える、まあ、チェックメイド816の結果から使えるようになったとすると、実前に測っておかないと、まあ、PCR になったらもう何も分からないことになっちゃうので、そうですねまあ、しかもそのまあ実前の検体で、やっぱそこら辺かん考えながら、まあ多分治療戦略考えると思いますし、あと、まあ、ドライバー寺院のステータスも先に知っておかないと後から分からないということもありうるので、まあ、実践にまあ分かる情報全部欲しいなというふうには個人的に思いますそれは確かにそうです、ね。矢田部先生、その検査をしてくださいって頼まれる側の目線からいかがでしょうか<笑>、まあ、あのしてくださいと言われればあのやるんですけれども、一つはですね実践の検体と、それからあのアドバンスの検体が、同じように採取されて、同じようにその陽性率が出るかと思うと、そうじゃないですよね。当然、実前、あの手術のオペラブルの,あの検体というのは小さいわけですし、アプローチの方法も限られてます。例えば、あの4期みたいにどこでも取ればいいやっても、あの転移先がもあるという状況とは違うので、果たして本当にその政権で取,られ取ることができるのかどうか。その、えー、と精神率というかですね、きちんとヒット率があの、えー、4期と同じようにあの得られるのかどうかというのは、そこはやっぱり十分に配慮していただきたいと思うんですね。もう一つはあの、まあ、検査をする上でですね、PDL1、かなり日本では、まあ、あの今のディスカッションあったように思うんですが、あまあ、ドクター・フィリップ言われていたようにその、やっぱり EGFR のことも、ヨーロッパの人と話すと、ずいぶん気にされるんですよね。えーとまあえー、とキーノート091でしたっけ、なんか一つ、そのえー、と EJ フォルのステータスがあんまりその、えー、と関与しないのがありましたけれども、まあ、一般的に言って、EJ フォルアルクはあまりその、えー、とイムチェックポイントイビタあのなかなか走行しづらいというようなところもあるので、それもやっぱり入れて考える必要があるのかなというのは思っておりました、はい、三上先生、いかがですか、この点。あのフェリップ先生が最後の本に見せたあの816の,あの PCR かどうかでの,あの4本の線がありましたけど、PCR だったらケモもあの IO も変わらなかったし、PCR でない人はあまりどっちも良くないということは、PCR が出るかどうかをより予測した方がいいと思うんですよね。だからそういう意味でもやっぱり実前の
、その BL1 ステータスとかいうのはすごい大事じゃないですかね、適応にするというときに、エーシャンセレクションで、あのネオジパンとセッティングですけど、まあ、もちろんそのイージョルビテーションが分かんないとか、そういうのももちろん大事だと思うし、そのより正確にその PCR になる患者さんを予測するという意味で,で重要なのではないかというふうに思いましたありがとうございます。まさになんかその点が次のところなんですが、まあ、これが多分おそらくあの今日取り扱える最後のテーマになると思いますけれども、術前治療の効果判定のところに関して、えー、とこれはどちらかというと、矢田部先生の方からコメントいただいた方がいいのかな今、三上先生があの PCR とか、あれ、術前治療の NPR とかについての期待感をご表明いただきましたけれども。さて、これ、日本、まあ、ISLC とかではリコメンデーション出してますけど、日本国内でどのぐらいこうユニフォームなのができるのかとか、あるいはその辺の含めて、八戸先生、今、料理の先生方はどんなふうに取り組んでいらっしゃるんでしょうか。えー、と一つはですね、あの日本あの肺がん学会の、えー、と病理委員会では、えーと、やっぱり ISLC のリコメンデーションとかを組み入れた、えー肺がん取扱い規約の実現術後の評価判定について、まあ、統一的なあのプロトコルを作ろうというふうに今考えております。でそれを今年中に何とかリリースしてですね、えーえー、っとそれを将来的な第,第9版のですね肺がん取扱い規約に入れられたらいいのかなというふうに思っています。ただ現状としてはですねやっぱりユニフォームなそのえー、っと規約っていうのがなかなかなくて、それが ISLC のあれしかないですよね。そうすると、うん、なかなかそれを肺がんにとあの興味がある病院の先生はいいんですけど、そうじゃない先生はなかなか知らないと思うんですよね。うん、それともう一つ、今これ肺がんの学会だからあのそういうことをでかなり興味を持たれてるんでしょうけれども、これがですね、えっ、ー、と乳がんと大腸がんと全く違ったりですね。それからあの。えー、とテューマーベッドというのが今一番その使われてるんですけどもその定義がですね臓器ごとによって違うというふうになりそうだというようなことがあってですねかなり混沌としているんですねああのなんとかそういったこところをまとめて、えー、と統一的なですね、えー、少なくとも肺がんについては肺がん学会を中心に先にできると思うんですがなかなかその、えー、と病理全般に行くのは難しいかなというのはあの思っている感じているところです。ありがとうございます。今の現状についてご報告いただきましたこの点、あ,のあれですね、三富先生、剣本先生、津谷先生、どなたでも構いませんけど、何かしら、なんか期待感とかこうど、どうでしょうか。特になければ、じゃあ、津谷先生、あれですね、あいやあのいや三富先生でもいいですけど、どうぞ、どうぞ。いえいえどうぞじゃあ、津谷先生、お願いします。あいいですかあどうぞ、剣本先生。いやその内科医は今までそのラジオロジカルレスポンスでやってきたので、まあ、それに比べれば十分、えー、と料理で見た方が治療効果、評価できるという感じはするんですが、矢部先生言ったように、標準化が難しいのと、施設によって評価が違ってしまうと、そもそも難しいなっていうハードルはあると思うんですが、ただ、まあ、こういうことがきっかけで、やっぱりその MPR という概念がみんなで統一して、まあ、あ日本、世界で同じような目線で見えるようになったときには、やっぱり、あの 30% で評価してた、我々が測って 30% で評価したあのレシストよりは、個人的にはやっぱり MPR の方が治療効果を反映してるんじゃないかなという感じはします、うん、そうですよね、内,内科の医がこうピッて測って、うん、30% って言ってるのと、うん<笑><笑>ってはい、どうぞ、三先生。100メー8 1 6をよく見るとですね、あの要するに、P、NPR だけど PCR でないというのは、の IO、ケモアームは少ないんですよね。だから、レスポンスというのはほとんどかなりが PCR になっていて、一方、ケモはその NPR だけど PCR でない人が多いとかいうのがありますよね。なので、まあ、そこがちょっとその IO の違いかということと、まあ、そのトライアルとしてはそのサロゲートマーカーとしてそういうのを評価するのは大事だと思うんですけどクリニカルプラクティスとしてそんなに大事なのかなという気もちょっとしますけどそれ,それどうでしょうあら意外と引き目のコメントです,です<笑>、ええ、そのクリニカルにルーティンにこれが PCR か NPR を厳密に判定してももう治療はやっちゃってるわけですよねなのでどうなのかなちょっと思いましたけど、まあ、そのディシジョンを早くすると、うん、クリニカルトライアルの豪華、濃豪化を決める、サロゲートになるということを証明したことは大事と思うんですけど
クリニカルプラクティスでそれを一生懸命見てどう使うかっていうのはちょっとどう思われます、うん、分かりました、うんまあ、でもちょっと今の点についてはむしろもう次の,あのところに行った方がいいかもしれません。なんか結局あの次に考えたのが術前と術後とかいろいろな選択肢が増えてきたときに、まあ、あの三富先生がお指摘になったのはおそらく術前で PCR になったらどうしようとかって評価するのであれば結局術後の治療どうしようかとかってとこになってくるけれども、まあ、そもそもあのいきなりオペでプライマリーサージャリーでアジバントであればそんなこと悩まなくてもいいわけですし、まあ、あのその辺で多分、えっと、術前がメインになるか術後がメインになるかっていうところあるいは手術期っていう形でっていうのがメインになるかによってもだいぶ違ってくるのかなと思います。先ほどの三つ先生のコメントも含めて、津谷先生、あのどうですかね、この辺外科の先生からも全部実演やりたいとかって、そんな感じでしょうか。ありがとうございます。えっとまあ、今回の3つの試験の結果を見ると、やっぱこう、816の結果がやっぱりインパクト大きいので、まあ、できれば実演するのがいいかなと、個人的には思うんですけれども、あのまあ、そのためにやっぱりこう、実演の例えばリンパ節などのこう正確な診断とか、そういうところは、こう非常に重要になってくるのかなというふうには思いますし、まあ、先ほどもあの三住先生言われましたこう PCR かどうかで術後どうかっていうのはその、まあ、もし PCR だったらまあ術後何もしなくていいと思うんですけど、まあ、今後こうサンドイッチみたいな形でネオとアジバントみたいなのが入ってくると、まあ、その病理学的評価効の有無でまた術後するかどうかとか、まあ、そういうディスカッションが今後は出てくるのかなというふうには思いました。そういう時には、術前の時の病理学的な効果判定も結構重要になってくるかもしれないっていう。かもしれないですね。うん、はい。ケモン先生、いかがですかこの点。まあ、でも今の点は、でも、先生、PCR じゃなかったら結局アジュバントやるから、MPR かどうかはあんまり個人的にはプラクティスとは関係ない気がしますけど、ただ結局、さっきレシストの話を出したのは、えっと、先生が言われた通りで、そのシングルアームの試験の解釈をするときは意味があるだけであって、そもそもレスポンスレートだって別にクリニカルの実診療では別にあんまり意味がないことかなと思ってます。なので、あのー、やっぱり早期開発、早期に、えっと、治療の効果を判断する一つの材料にはなりうるというのは私は思ってます。うん、あともう一つちょっと関係してなんですけど、いいですか、藤井先生。はい、もちろん。あのあの気持ちはですね、要するに PCR になってなかったら、アジバントを追加するという気持ちは分かるんだけど、そもそも IO があんまり効いてない人に後から足してもあんまり変わらないかもしれないという気もしますけど、その辺はどう,どうでしょう。これは、ケモ先生に聞きましょうか。<笑>あでも先生、さっきお話ししたように、PR でも続いてると思って、僕らはメインテナンスをするので。えっと、MPR が効いてないのか、の ICI が不十分なのかの判断は難しいかなと思ってますので、あの効いてないはちょっと言い過ぎかなと思いますけど。わかりました。まあ、うんまあ、それはトライアルが証明するということですかね、そのうち。うん、そう思ってます。なので、の MPR で良さそうだったときには、その試験同士、もしくはその今の標準治療に戦いを挑むというのは十分あの、ディシジョンをできるあのエンドポイントになるんでしょうけど、ただ、最初にお話したように、標準化がどこまで進むかというのは非常に大事かなと思っていますありがとうございます。ちょっと最後に僕、質問したいけど、やっぱり先生、病理学的な効果判定のタイミングってもあったりしませんかね。なんか例えば、こう最初にちょろっとだけ IO やってあの、すぐに PCR になる人もいれば、なんかじわじわって聞いてくる人もいらっしゃりそうなんですけれども、まあ、それはタイミングを変えることはできないかなと思うんですが。ですね、あの例えばそのイメージあの前あの、スーパーフレアとかですね、あのえー、とプログレッションあに伴って、需要が増大するとか、そういったものがあのイメージエンジコフォルトインヒビダーで言われてますよね。ですから、あの少しタイムポイントを変えたもので、あのサブ解析でぜひあの、国からトライアル等々でやってもらえるといいかなというふうに思うんですけれど。えー、と実際、私たちも見てみたいなと思うんですけど、例えば一周、えー、と例えばそのイベンチェックポイントインヒビターじゃないんですけども、例えばジャームセルティーマーなんかではあの、不十分だった人のケノセラピーのところとか見ることがあるんですけども、やっぱりその、えー、と像が全然違うので、えーと、そういった点も考慮しながらですね、あの見せていただいて、えーと、結果を出して検証するというのをぜひしていただきたいなと思います。ありがとうございますでは、8時になってしまいましたので、ちょっと名残惜しいんですけれども、このぐらいで日本語のセッションを閉じて全体を閉じたいというふうに思います。あのパネリストの先生方、ありがとうございました。
。ありがとうございました。はい。So thank you everybody.、Uh, I would I'd like to close this webinar and、uh, I, I would like to thank the Professor Fabio again because、uh, she answered all the question in text. Uh, we are the Q and A, and he is still joining the even for the Japanese session. Yeah, thank you very much.、Mm. So、uh, I would I'd like to close this、uh, this webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.